drawing on the source. In 1845, in Pagetown, Ohio, was born Mary Caroline Page, that we in Unity know as Myrtle Fillmore. She was born into a family who had lots of weakness, physical weakness and sickness. And from a very early age, she was told that this was her plight as well. And so being an innocent child, listening to the people who loved her and cared for her, she believed what was being taught to her and fell right in with the rest of her family in sickness and weakness. And even though uh, she was dealing with these things, she managed to not only finish school, but in a day when few women went to college, she went to Overland College and became a teacher and uh, moved to um, Missouri and taught school. Later on, she moved to Denison, Texas. Woohoo! <laughs> and that's where she met Charles Fillmore, Charles Sherlock Fillmore. And they got married eventually, after courting for a couple of years. She had two sons and became weaker and sicker as time went by. Now here's something that even if you've been in unity a while that you may not know about Myrtle Fillmore. Even before the term was coined, Myrtle Fillmore was a cougar. Charles was 11 years younger than Myrtle. Ooh. Back in a day when that wasn't done. So as time went by, she became sicker and sicker. It became apparent she wasn't even able to take care of her two sons. Her mother-in-law, Mrs. Fillmore, um, did most of the cooking and cleaning and caring for the two sons. But one day she heard of a uh, Christian science practitioner in Kansas City, Missouri. He was giving a lecture, and it was about health and wholeness and healing and God's intention for us as God's expression, God's children, if you will. And so she talked Charles into taking her to it. I understand that she had, had to do some talking because Charles, being a scientific person and a skeptic, wasn't really sold on this uh, Christian science. And uh, in unity, we call it practical Christianity and that type of thing. But they went. E.B. Weeks was the practitioner's name. And... Uh, Myrtle took away this phrase that was to change her life for the better. She heard him say, I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit sickness. She took that in and saw that as a ray of hope because her doctors had, had actually told her, we've done all that we know how to do for you, Get your affairs in order. There's nothing else that we can do. She had tuberculosis and some other things. And back then, tuberculosis was a death sentence, basically. So she started using this uh, affirmation. I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit sickness. She added to that, she... Uh, it, uh, a little bit of history is that she was a minister's daughter and uh, having been brought up uh, in a home where faith was a foundation. It was a foundational piece of her home. She then, in addition to using this affirmation, she went to her Bible and she found passages that had to do with God's intention for us God's intention for us to be whole and healthy and well. 
And so she used those as affirmations. Um, the stories go that she would sit in a chair for hours sometimes reading and singing and um, uh, quoting these affirmations. And another thing that she did that now uh, science is catching up with, I think it was, let's see, it was uh, 1886 when she heard E.B. Weeks uh, say this affirmation. But here is something that she, is, that she did in 1886 that is now catching on in science. Don't you just love it when scientists catch up with what mystics have known for centuries? I love that. She would talk to the parts of her body that she had previous to that called weak. She would call out her liver, her lungs, her arms, her legs, various organs, heart, eyes. And she would apologize to these organs for calling them weak and calling them sick. And right behind that apology, she would say uh, an affirmation call, calling forth health and wellness, opening herself and opening her mind, therefore opening the cells of her body to healing. She did this in about two years, she was restored to health where she could take care of her sons and she went on to have another son. And as people started to see this, they saw her, they knew um, in her community, they knew that the doctors had get, given up on her. But then they saw her getting well and they saw her getting stronger and able to do things that prior to that she had not been able to do. And so people started coming and saying, basically, what are you doing? We want to know. I want what you have. Uh, my cousin's child, uh, can we bring my cousin's child over? It eventually um, culminated in a regularly scheduled Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, gathering of people that came. And there are stories of what we would call miraculous healings that came from this. Well, eventually there were too many people to fit in their living room, and so they uh, went to a hall, and it grew and grew and grew, and the rest, as they say, is history. We have now what we call the unity movement. It never started out to be a church per se. It started out as a collection of people uh, with one intention in mind, and that was to be whole, healthy, well, and be all that God intended them to be. And this is what grew out of it. We're seeing now, um, as, as history shows, we have a pendulum, a, a, a invisible and invisible pendulum that swings. We'll swing in one direction, uh, it really, it's, it's head, it's science, it's intelligence, uh, uh, the intellect and all of that. And then eventually the pendulum will swing to its heart, its intuition, its feeling, its knowing, and that type of thing. And sometimes we're lucky enough to live in an era where the pendulum is in the middle so that we draw off of science and intellect and we draw off of heart and intuition. And I feel like I, this is my um, humble but correct opinion. <laughs> we are living in that time when the pendulum is in the middle. We have the um, benefit of science, being able to prove in laboratories and research and we live at a time when intuition and spirituality and depth of soul is readily available to us. This is a part of a series that I'm doing on Unity Classics. Um, the, the Unity Classics will move on up to uh, the Sunday before Advent will be the last Sunday of the Unity Classics, and then begins Advent. Myrtle 
Fillmore had a heart for children in, uh, during this time of unity movement. The longest running children's magazine was written and edited by Myrtle Fillmore, and it was called We Wisdom. It went out of print in the 90s. I'm not really sure why. My guess would be it uh, lowered interest or something. But it, it went on for many years. It was the longest running uh, children's magazine ever. She had a heart for children, a heart for teaching the children. She uh, is quoted as having said in one of the meetings, people were deciding what to do with the unity movement as a whole, and I guess talking about uh, programs and uh, classes and various things, and she is quoting as having said, who will take care of the children? That was where her heart was, and so, in her writings, she only actually wrote one book. Charles was a pretty prolific writer. Um, I don't know how many books, I'm, I'm gonna say 18 or 20. And he wrote constantly. Um, she wrote one book and the name of the book is How to Let God Help You. Sometime do yourself a favor. It's, a, it's an easy read. It, it's, uh, there have been times that people have called Myrtle the heart of the unity movement and Charles the head of the unity movement. In her book, How to Let God Help You, she, her heart just shows in these pages. It's, each chapter is only, I'm gonna say, maybe three or four pages, very short and to the point, very simple, very open, you can see, or, or it was apparent to me, her heart went onto those pages. Another book was compiled because back in those days, um, people wrote to Unity Headquarters. There was the Society of Silent Unity is how it started out. Um, does anybody not know what Silent Unity is? Okay, it's our 24 hour prayer line. And it started uh, back when, shortly after the unity movement started. And letters would come in, in the mail. And Myrtle Fillmore would uh, answer some of these letters. Now she had uh, people, other people that would write the letters as well. Well, there is another book, which is a compilation of her answers to people. And the name of that book is uh, Myrtle Fillmore's Healing Letters. Either one of those, it's, they are simple reads, they're very, you can pick them up and put them down easily, and it shows so much heart, so much love. So when we think about the, the title, Drawing on the Source, Drawing on the Source, whether or not we know it, whether or not we believe it, here again is my humble but correct opinion, we always, always, always are drawing on the source. Always. We may not know it, we may not be aware of it, we may feel completely separated, but the source, God, spirit, the divine, is always, always, always with us, always. Did I say always? <laughs> always. There is never, never a time in your life that God is not right there with you and within you. This is Myrtle Fillmore's healing letters, the crux of Myrtle Fillmore's healing letters to me. It, it always goes back to drawing on the source. At the very worst times in our lives, at our very lowest moments in our lives, God is there. At those times in our life when we have hit a pinnacle and we think it can't get any better than this, God is there. At those times in our life when it's just mediocre, just humdrum and that sort of thing, God is there. For the brushing of our teeth, for the walking of the dog, 
or the preparing of the meal, whatever. God is always with us. And it is each of our opportunity, obligation, responsibility to draw on that source. We still have to open ourselves. We still have to recognize. And not that God can't act without us recognizing it, but it just works better if we allow ourselves to be a conduit. Jesus said, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, now, probably all in our childhood, we've seen those little balls with the mustard seed in the inside of it. So you know how tiny a mustard seed is. You can say to a mountain, move from here to there, and the mountain will obey. And remember, too, that Jesus said, you can do everything that I've done, and even greater things can you do. Can you turn water into wine? Have you done that recently? I bet you helped to heal someone, <coughs> holding prayer, even if it's not a, a, a big deal, so to speak, even if it's not healing someone, helping to heal someone, being the conduit of the energy of healing, that you've seen that you have uh, helped to cure someone from a life-threatening disease. But I'll bet that you have been, <clears throat> excuse me, been in a situation where you, the healing energy flowed through you to someone, allowing that someone to heal. So what would be, if you had to think about the opposite of um, faith, one of the opposites of faith is fear. We can't have faith and fear in the same moment. They're opposite each other. So opening our hearts and minds to our faith, Jesus said to the woman who touched the hem of his garment, your faith has made you whole. It is our faith. It is by faith that we draw on the source. At any time, any point in our life, it is by faith. We have faith in the fact that source is there with us always. You have all of the faith at this very moment that you're ever gonna have in your entire life. If you've never heard that before, that can be unnerving. Because many times we hear people say, I wish I had his faith. I wish I had her faith. We have innately within us all of the faith that we're ever going to have. And the upside of that is it's all the faith we're ever going to need. It's, it's up to each of us to draw on that faith that is given to us. So one opposite of, fear, of faith is fear. Martha Smock was a, an editor of the Daily Word magazine. Faith is the spiritual side of hope. When we have faith, we do not just hope for the best, but we look at things that appear, at the persons or the problems, at life, at ourselves, and we have eyes to see past appearances to the substance of the underlying God. In unity, sometimes we interchange the two, substance and God, because God is the substance with, from which all is made. Drawing from the source. I knew I was going to have way more notes than I had time. I love it when that happens. One of, one of the um, pieces of good news is God has stacked the deck in your favor. We are here with everything that we will ever need. We have every opportunity. We have every gift. We have every talent. We have all of the money, all of the money that we will ever need. It is our responsibility to reach out and take hold of these things in whatever way we see possible 
in that moment, and sometimes in ways that we don't even see as possible. Faith sometimes causes us, invites us, draws us out of our comfort zone into a place of the unknowing. And many times this place of the unknowing goes against uh, our common belief system. Sometimes our common belief system says, this is not possible. Here are the facts. Look at the facts. The research has been done. It's been written down. However, some of you will remember this. Roger Bannister, the four-minute mile. It was thought before he ran the four-minute mile that it was not humanly possible to do that. Shortly after, a couple of months after he ran the four-minute mile, so did about 50 other people. Then it became so common that, that high school students were doing it. There are those people, there are those who need permission like that. Somebody else does it, I see it, so that gives me permission. But some of us are trailblazers. Some of us are the ones that step out in faith and give permission, or at least open up permission. This is faith. So much more in my notes. <laughs> God is limited. To whatever we will receive. God is limited to whatever we are willing to do. God is limited to us stepping out and doing what is each of ours to do in the world, whatever that is. We are how God expresses in the world. If world, when world peace happens, there again, it's my humble but correct opinion, world, world peace is possible, and I tend to see it. It is each of our duties, responsibilities, opportunities to be peace in the world, to step out in faith. Even when you look around and there's no one around you, there's no one even following you, you step out and do what is yours to do in the world. We do what is ours to do in the world. So I'm going to leave you with a quotation. Ellen Devonport um, was the minister, unity minister, for about 10 years in Wimberley. I believe it was Wimberley. Wimberley, the Unity Church in Wimberley, Texas. Okay. I'm getting a nod from Tuli, so I guess it's right. She is... Um, She's written many books and uh, is in the unity movement is considered a go-to person for, I, I consider Ellen to be a mystic in this world. Out of our unity principles, principle one maintains we are one with God, not separate, not being watched, but we are immersed in the divine. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the Athenians, we live and move and have our being in God and in oneness. God lives and moves and has expression in each of us. Drawing on the divine. You never have and never will be called on to do something that is not yours to do. Spirit will never ask you to do your neighbor's work, your spouse's work, your children's work, your parents' work. It is yours to do. And everything that you are called to do, you are equipped to do. And so um, I like to read and sometimes watch Joel Osteen. He has a positive message. I learned a long time ago that I don't necessarily need to agree with a per person completely in order to get nuggets of wisdom, wisdom from them. And I heard him say, and this I'm saying to you this morning, God does not call the equipped, but equips the called. You are each called.